Hello, hello, and welcome to today's EdTech Strategy Session. We are so happy to have you, and I hope that you will go in the chat and introduce yourself. Let us know what your role is and where you're joining from. And thank you so much for joining today. The EdTech Strategy Sessions happen once every month on the second Friday of the month. And we take a break for summer. So I hope you guys will register for our final EdTech strategy session before that summer break on May 10th, where we're gonna hear from speakers about working with AI enabled tools and a fun little librarian delivered AI history for educators, which will be really interesting and give us some background to all of where we are today with all of the AI hype. So that's on May 10th at the same time, 1 p.m. Eastern. And my colleague Ebony just put in the chat the Zoom registration link for that May EdTech strategy session. We hope to see you guys there. Again, we thank you for joining today for the April EdTech strategy session, which is brought to you by the EdTech Center at World Education. Today, we're joined by two awesome Lightning Talk speakers. The first Lightning Talk will be delivered by Dr. Mary Gaston, who is going to introduce us to the updated Bridges Digital Skills Framework and the resources that are associated with that framework. And then we'll hear from Erin Vivornik on Universal Design for Learning, or UDL. Today's session is supported by our EdTech Center staff, myself, I'm Rachel Riggs, Technical Advisor for the EdTech Center, and my colleagues, Jeff Gumas, Ebony Vandross, and Justine Shade are also here to support the session. We want to remind you every EdTech strategy session has two lightning talks, and at the end of the hour, we open up breakout rooms so that you can talk directly with the speakers, ask them your questions, and have a nice small group discussion. So from 2 p.m. Eastern to 2.30 p.m. Eastern, we hope that you will get into a breakout room and ask any questions that you may have. The EdTech Center um, has a newsletter and we are active on LinkedIn. So if you want to continue to get updates about what we're covering in the EdTech strategy sessions or the different projects we're working on or blogs that we've written or resources we've published, <laughs> We're very active, so I hope that you'll consider subscribing to our newsletter um, and or following and connecting with us on LinkedIn. Ebony is also putting the links to subscribe and follow um, in the chat. Thank you, Ebony. The EdTech Strategy Sessions are an initiative of our IDEAL Consortium. IDEAL is a consortium of states who are at the forefront of innovating digital education for adult learners. That's what IDEAL stands for. And we sustain a community of practice, lots of collaboration, and innovative strategies that come out of that consortium. So we thank all of the member states for supporting the EdTech Strategy Sessions as part of that community of practice. And without further ado, I'm honored to introduce you to Dr. Mary Gaston. Dr. Gaston is a training and technical assistance specialist for the South Carolina um, adult Education Office, and she has served as a subject matter expert for the Digital Resilience in, American work, in the American Workforce OCTE funded project called DRAW. And we have been really, really delighted to work with Mary through various EdTech maker spaces. She's very much a leader in our field when it comes to integrating digital literacy and the use of educational technology in adult education. Um, so we're really glad that she could join us today and share with us what she's been working on with the Digital Skills Framework Bridges. Mary, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Rachel. I am so glad to be here and I feel so blessed that I have uh, had this opportunity to work alongside both um, Jeff and Rachel and others as we've uh, been on this journey. And to talk, a I don't think he needs an introduction, but um, my, uh, my uh, colleague and my friend Jeff is going to start us off by talking about how we got where we are.
And he's going to unmute himself too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want to make this whole thing 20 minutes about how great Mary is as well, Rachel, but we'll talk about bridges and we can do that and break out. Um, so yeah, Mary asked me to kind of go over how we got to the point that we are now unveiling this new, but not that new framework called bridges. Um, and so just some quick background on this, because many of you may be familiar with this. Um, we, in 2019, as part of the Digital Us initiative, this was a coalition, a national coalition of employers, national organizations, philanthropists, uh, policymakers, that were looking to uh, remove barriers to accessing devices and Wi-Fi uh, and digital skills development. And, and as part of that process, we're under identifying what the barriers are, but then also identifying promising practices to help alleviate those barriers. And one of the things that we encountered as part of this uh, in landscape scan uh, was uh, the need for frameworks and defining the digital skills that are needed uh, in order to help people achieve their personal, their civic, their workplace, their education goals. Um, and a framework we were introduced to in this process was developed from the University of Washington and the city of Seattle through the Seattle Digital Equity Initiative. Um, and this was this comparison framework that we have since called the Seattle Digital Equity Initiative Digital Skills Framework um, that was built based on doing a comparison of a number of other frameworks that were in, are and were in use as well as curricula and assessments and identifying the key skills that are, are most prevalent across all of those different frameworks, assessments, and curricula. And so we decided to move forward with that from that point. And a lot of the work that Mary's been involved in, I know some of the people in this uh, session have been involved in, has been through crowded learning uh, and through our digital resilience in the American Workforce Initiative in aligning high quality resources to this framework with the goal of pulling together activities, games, lesson plans, projects, et cetera, that align to these skills from these various sources that you see and probably are familiar with here so that people can identify a skill and then see what is available to help develop that skill with learners. And so if you're not familiar with this framework, which is what Mary is about to dive into, um, there's 10 domains across these three core areas uh, looking at different things like basic device ownership and basic skills, uh, workplace and productivity, communication, all of the things that we are doing with technology, but defined across these 10 domains and these 75 skills. Um, and the goal of Bridges, which we brought Mary on to support, and Mary's been involved in our digital skill work since the beginning, has been to expand this initial framework, Seattle, by providing a little bit more meat and a little bit more guidance on how you can use different resources to actually start developing these skills. Um, so in addition to the original, initial framework with definitions, we've expanded those definitions and we've also provided relevant examples uh, so that people can see some tangible exemplars of what it means to be demonstrating this skill in the real world. Um, and we're also making stronger connections to other things that you may be familiar with if you follow the EdTech Center World Education or Crowded Learning um, that make more direct connections between the framework and what you can be using to develop these skills with learners. So I am going to pass it now on to Mary and stop my share and she is going to walk through bridges. Thank you. All right, big reveal, although I think some of you have already seen it and the uh, link has been put in the chat a couple of times. Someone may wanna drop it again, but I am going to take you to the page where the preview version of Bridges Digital Skills Framework now lives. Here's your button to get the current copy. Now you're gonna wanna continue visiting this page um, as updates are gonna continue to be made over the coming weeks. All right. As Jeff said, it's not just about a list of skills, but also a whole collection of resources that are going to support the development of these skills. We're gonna go over these seven resources today. I'm gonna to take the first five and Jeff is gonna finish up with the last two. We're gonna to try to do it in as relaxed a fashion as possible. It's going to be hard because I'm going to want to show you more than I have time to in the lightning talk. But if you want to see uh, anything more or dive in deeper into any of these resources, 
please be sure to join us in the breakout following the lightning talks. So this is a page from the book, from the framework book. And I am going to go ahead and dive into that document. And I forgot, oh, if this makes you dizzy, look away. I forgot to scroll back up this morning. <laughs> so um, every domain, remember there are three categories of skills, 10 domains and 75 skills. So this is the communication domain. Every domain begins with a set of guiding questions. These are general questions about the domain. They can be used to help frame your thinking um, about your own skill levels. Um, instead of just reading off a list of the skills that are in there, if you're beginning a discussion with a group of learners, you can um, uh, introduce a domain in this way. You've got the list of skills and a description of all the skills. And then you have what we call I can statements. These I can statements are tangible examples of what a skill can look like across different contexts, my life, my work, my education. This is especially important with our adult learners who have diverse backgrounds and different levels of experience for them to see how one skill can look uh, in different situations. We also added a column for us as teachers and trainers to show what that skill can look like in our practice as well. Now these I can statements can be used as informal performance assessments and you can have students demonstrate their own I can statements once they have mastered a skill. Also for every domain, you're gonna have a collection of vocabulary specific to that domain. You're also gonna have a list of tools. Let's take a look at that. Once again, if this makes you dizzy, look away for a minute. I'm gonna show you these things for communication. So this is um, the vocabulary list for, for communication. You have a link to the digital skills glossary because each one of these words is included in the glossary, which has, um, a collection of resources that can um, support the development of, the, of this vocabulary. This is quite the uh, extensive list right here. So we're gonna scroll down through that and show you uh, what the tools look like. Every domain has a list of tools. These can be used to talk to students about what they might be able to do when they master the skills, or it can be used to generate ideas for you to um, do activities within the classroom as you're developing skills. The digital skills library. Um, someone wants to drop the link to the digital skills library. This is an open repository of free learning resources designed to support the development of these skills and to help students achieve their goals. It's managed by the EdTech Center at World Education. And one of the really cool things to me is that all the resources within this, and look at this, 1800, all of the resources have been curated by educators in EdTech makerspaces. And I've seen some of my maker friends on here today, and we thank you to align to the digital skills in the framework. So let's take a look at the digital skills library. And again, it's going to be hard for me just to do this really quick overview, but I'm going to try to stick to it. Um, so you can explore by domain. When you click on one of these, you see the skills with all the codes beside them, and you can search that way. Or you can just search the entire library right here. You can add the code of a specific skill, or you can search by keyword. I'm going to punch in the word email. And to give you an idea of the wealth, you can click this button. It's going to load 12 at a time, but you'll click view more and then view more and then view more as you continue to load 12 at a time because there are a lot of resources about email. I'm going to click on one of the cards to show you. When you do that, you can launch that specific activity. If that activity is part of a parent resource, a bigger resource, you can actually go to that big one. It's going to tell you what kind of format it is. This one is a lesson. It's going to show you the related skills, and it's going to tell you more about each resource. Now, these are a lot of resources, so you might want to filter. You have the ability to filter by the kind of re by the name of the resource. Maybe you have a favorite or your learners have a favorite. You can search by format. What kind of resource is it? 
You can search by subtopic, or you can even search by language and see if the resources are available in different languages. And number three, the digital skills glossary. We are at 350 terms and counting. This was developed by over 40 educators in February of 23 as part of the DRAW Digital Resilience in the American Workforce Project. The makers found audio media, visual media, they designed slides and they created activities. We're gonna take a quick look at the digital skills glossary. And you can see that all of these things are connected. So the index is a spreadsheet. It includes all the words, the definitions. Each word is assigned a theme, a main theme. Now it may belong to other themes as well, but for the purposes of organization has one theme. And so um, an educator could go into the spreadsheet, search by theme, grab up a group of the words and definitions and plug them into something like a word wall or a flippity to build other activities to reinforce the vocabulary. Every word has a slide, 350 slides. These are the same slide decks. They're just organized differently. This one's alphabetical. This one is thematic by that main theme I talked about here. I'm gonna show you one of the slides. So I am in the thematic slide deck right now. I am at the section break called email and messaging. The next slide has all of the email and messaging terms that are included in that section. And this is what the slides look like. They all have this similar look. There's the term, the definition, a sentence to help build context, and an image. There's also a link to um, an audio pronunciation. And we tried to find as many as we could with Google, and I'll show you in a minute why. Although we couldn't at that time find all of them, so you will run across some other resources. Um, it's important to note that these slides are open, adaptable, reusable, so you can come here, download the ones you want, and then if you want a simpler sentence or a more complex sentence, you're free to change it. If you want a different image related to what's going on in your classroom, you can do that as well. All right, wanted to show you this. Um, in case you haven't seen it, so when you when you link when you click the audio link, attach, attach, so they can hear it and see the mouth. They can slow it down if they want. Attach, to. attach. I am not going to demonstrate the practice because it doesn't always like my southern accent. Uh, maybe if you come to the breakout, I'll do that. But um, it it records and then lets a person know, a user know whether or not they're on target with their pronunciation. So I'm gonna go back to the glossary resources. And we also have the instructor guide. This is a Google doc. It provides lots of details about how to use the materials, how to make copies of the materials, but it also has activity ideas that were built by the makers in the makerspace. And I'm gonna go back to the slide. And this is where I would really love to have time to dive into that. <laughs> and, uh, but you can explore on your own, um, the really great activities there. So when the um, makers uh, were um, encouraged to build an activity related to um, one of the themes and a group of words from the glossary, they were asked to choose one of these strategies for building digital resilience through language. So this is what one of the activities looks like inside um, the guide. You have, um, here's, this one is um, recognizing common features and functions. It's about social media and Tiffany's here today. Tiffany, uh, this, is, this is one of yours and the terms that were used and then a description, a brief description uh, kind of guides someone to um, implement that activity in their own room. So, I mean, in their own classroom. Thank you for all of the work that you guys did to make that happen. Number four is checklists for self-assessment and goal setting and possibly even doing observations of, uh, of learners demonstrating skills. This one, some of you may have seen before. This checklist is the um, checklist for diverse learners. It has different lists depending on the learner type. For example, senior citizen, parent, beginning user. Um, it can be used, as we said, you know, 
to look at what I can and can't do, what kind of goals do I want to set. And the beautiful thing is, again, it's it's adaptable. So these uh, suggested skills are just a beginning place. And you can um, remove some, add some, depending on, um, on your purpose. And it's a great tool for informing instruction and informing the design of any digital literacy programming. We're working on some other checklists as well. This is one that we completed that is built on the work of others. This one, we took a look at Seattle's um, survey they did of their communities last year. And what they did was they looked at 19 digital activities that are important to being um, included in um, digital the digital world. So we took those 19 activities, plugged them into a checklist, and each one of them, we, um, we went ahead and aligned to the skills from the Bridges framework. So if a learner or an educator were using this they can immediately see if a student says no, or maybe I can do it. They can go to the digital skills library, the link right here and look up the related skills for that. Another one we just finished is related to the um, NDIA's uh, checklist for digital skill navigators. We did the same thing, the same kind of format for that. And there are others coming as well. And then we know that not everyone used the Seattle framework. So recognizing that some might use North Star or use ISTE standards for students or DigComp 2.2, we have done crosswalks for those. How could this be used? Um, let's say that you use North Star assessments. You have a learner who takes a social media assessment and maybe the report says that they need to work on standard eight. The learner themselves or the educator trainer could immediately see here are the related skills for that. Go to the digital skills library and find resources to support developing those skills out further. So that was resource number five, and I am going to stop there and let Jeff pick it up and finish up with six and seven. All right, and um, just to note on those checklists, we have, uh, or the crosswalks, excuse me, we have crosswalks to North Star. We have crosswalks to you are seeing, which screen are you seeing? You're seeing the right screen, yay. Um, North Star, Digcom, and ISTE um, with these uh, checklists. So those are at, in the appendix at the end. Um, all right, so these are also more resources that you've seen, but again, I'm hoping you're seeing the connection that we're trying to make a stronger linkage between the framework and these other resources that have been developed, again, by many of the people on this call. Um, and so one other tool that you may be familiar with is the EdTech Integration Strategy Toolkit. And this is something that we came, uh, that we designed a couple of years ago, but uh, what people may forget is that all of the routines that are in this toolkit uh, are also aligned to the skills that are in the Bridges framework. So I'm actually gonna hop on over to it um, just so you can see it. Um, but when we go to the routines, I could also go to digital tools and look at digital tools um, and look at things like uh, breakout rooms and see what kind of tools have breakout rooms. But you'll see even with the tools, it links to uh, a particular routine. And this is a routine that you could use using video meetings and breakout rooms to have students practice speaking and presenting. Um, and so these routines are things that you can do within your regular classroom practice. So it's not specifically designed to teach digital skills, but it's something you might have students doing regardless as part of math instruction or reading instruction. But it walks through the routine, why it's a, a strong routine and evidence-based and how to do it, but then they also include digital skills. And these are the very skills that are also in the Bridges framework. And so all of the routines that are in this library, um, the EdTech Integration Strategy Toolkit aligned to Bridges, but then also this is a, another project that one of the other World Ed Initiatives did for the city of Boston. And they also developed a bunch of routines here on this website. And if someone can put in the chat, uh, I did link both of these in the notes for this um, particular slide. But I can go to any one of these areas and click on the category. This is communication. And here's a routine that was developed. And you can see it's got this what, why, how that was part of the EdTech Integration Toolkit. But again, then it also provides linkages to the bridges skills 
that are developed in this routine. So it's things you're doing in classroom practice, but how you can layer in the digital skills um, as part of that work. And then the last resource, if you're if you may have resource fatigue at this point, and <laughs> apologize for that. Um, the last resource that we're going to share is Skill Blocks. So uh, again, you've probably heard of Skill Blocks if you've followed the EdTech Center uh, and Crowded Learning. But Skill Blocks is a tool that allows you to actually build shareable lessons that integrate digital skills activities into them or, or other subject areas as well. It's a platform that we've built that organizes open education resources in a similar manner to say the digital skills library and all of the digital skills library resources are also in Skill Blocks. But instead of just finding a resource and then maybe sharing that with students, this allows you to build lessons and playlists that incorporate those different activities. So I'm gonna hop again over into here to my skill blocks account and i'll just show two skill blocks that were created by other people not me but this is my account and rachel's shared account um, but mary developed a skill blocks where she pulled from the digital skills library this great activity on creating simple formulas so this is from gcf global which is in the library um, and it's got a video on how to create simple formulas in google sheets and then she designed from using the digital skills glossary a vocabulary slide deck that incorporates terms that students need to know when using spreadsheets. So that's the first activity in her slide deck. And then, because she's the queen of really fun activities, she created a word wall that is this really fun, engaging, um, matching uh, tool here. There's other different games that you can do using the same terms and definitions. Uh, as front loading vocabulary before students actually go into the digital skills library activity, and then she created a activity for students to practice entering forms into a uh, Google Sheet. So basically taking this one resource from the library and building out activities that um, other that she can share with her students and have students work through. Um, and because Skillbox is designed to be shareable, as you'll see, I am, I saved her uh, her. Um, skill block here, but I can make a copy of it because she said it so that well, I could. I don't know why it's not letting me. That's really sad. It should be letting me. Let me refresh. Here we go. Um, and so here's my copy of that skill block. So now I have my own version of the skill block that Mary created. And if I want to edit her slides or add more content in here, I have the ability to do so. Um, and so this is getting into more deeper skill integration and building lessons and most importantly, sharing things. Um, through this tool called Skillbox. So that is Bridges in a nutshell. Um, and I think Rachel already put in the chat, but if you want to get updates uh, on Bridges in particular, um, the World Education newsletter is one to follow, the EdTech Center newsletter and the Crowded Learning newsletter. All of these will have updates to Bridges as this is something that we are continuing to evolve over the next few months with new resources like those checklists. Um, and other things, there was a question asked in the chat, we are going to do a Spanish language version of the framework um, so that it's available in at least two languages. Um, and uh, I did mention the chat as well in the library, you may have seen, but I will point out that um, there's always this submit a resource. So any of these pages, the library, uh, which is here, the glossary and the bridges framework, there's this link. If you have suggestions for resources to add to any of these things, um, please let us know and we will consider it. And just also, I know I'm supposed to take the slides, but a huge shout out to Mary for she has done volumes and volumes of work in her retirement um, to help build all of these things and also to the makers. Much of the content that's in the framework, those I can statements, those came from the very first digital skills library uh, at Tech Makerspace we did like two and a half years ago. So the fruits of your labor, sometimes it takes a while for them to be born into the world, but know that uh, your efforts have been part of what has created this uh, really comprehensive framework. Absolutely. And we are, if you guys have any questions, I would love for you to put them into the chat. And I know Jeff and Mary will be monitoring and will be able to answer anything you put there. Um, Paulina said this is a gold mine of ideas and a gold mine of resources, I think, too. Um, so just as a reminder, the recording of this lightning talk will be on YouTube. 
um, and on our website at this link here. So if you feel like you need to go back and <laughs> review some of the different resources that were introduced, um, you can definitely do that. And we will be sharing the slides and recording in a follow-up email. Um, and Jeff and Mary will be in a breakout room at the top of the hour, and you guys can talk some more about it there. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and transition us to our next lightning talk. Um, I wanted to make this brief announcement about the change agent. If you have ever heard of the change agent, you may know that it is a magazine that publishes the stories of adult learners and, um, students can get their work published in the change agent at any English proficiency level. Um, so we would really love for you to, let's see, how many of you are working with learners from between now and May 2nd? Let me know in the chat. If you're working with learners between now and May 2nd, I hope that you will introduce them to the change agent, show them the call for articles, and support them in submitting their writing to the change agent. Our next issue is on our digital future, and we really want to hear from learners about how they are interacting with technology, being impacted by technology, leveraging technology, and all of that good stuff. So please, please, please check that out and encourage your learners to submit an article to the change agent. And I'm so excited to introduce our next speaker. Um, I was looking at the 2024 National Educational Technology Plan, the NETP, because that's the kind of boring stuff that I do all the time. <laughs> no, just kidding. It's very interesting. Um, the NETP outlines three different digital divides, the digital use divide, digital access divide, and digital design divide. And within this year's 2024 NETP, universal design for learning is mentioned in over half of the pages of the NETP. It is a really significant approach that is super important to expanding access to learning and supporting um, really high quality learning. So when I saw that, I thought we've got to have Erin Vabornik, who does trainings on universal design for learning all the time, um, for a lightning talk to talk to us more about UDL. So Erin Vabornik is an ed educational training spe specialist at the Southern Illinois Professional Development Center, part of the Illinois Adult Education Professional Development Network. And their center supports educators, staff, and administrators in how to infuse UDL or Universal Design for Learning into their work. Erin has been an adult education classroom instructor for over 10 years and has been actively using UDL in her classrooms, both in person and virtual, for the past four years. This led Erin and her colleagues to begin the UDL Implementation and Research Network's first special interest group for those in the field of career, technical, and adult education. So we are very excited to have Erin. And Erin, take it away. Thank you. So I knew I was going to have big shoes to fill to follow Mary and Jeff. So I am, we're infusing some um, interesting slides. So uh, universal design for learning can often feel like a wilderness of ideas and guidelines at first glance, and I am here to guide you through this journey, dare I say hike, and that is the metaphor we're going with today. I'm going to put in the chat a copy of these UDL guidelines, just in case you like to see them, but everything that you need will be shown on the slides, so feel free to just save that for a later date if you'd like. So despite the fact that the outline right here <laughs> appears to be linear on this graphic, we'll cover each area at multiple points. And these four topics are woven together in a UDL-driven classroom. And we need to identify first what it means to be an adult um, education student, an overview of what UDL is, and then move on to how we apply it and grow as UDL educators. And so the goals here are to really investigate those core principles and more importantly, how they relate to adult education classrooms. I'll provide some practical strategies for implementing UDL. And then of course, identify further resources because it is something that takes a little bit of time to really dig in and to make it your own. So let's begin by looking at who walks or comes into our classroom. 
So this information is likely not new information to you, but it's important we begin with a shared understanding of who we're talking about when we talk about adult education students. Um, so first, how our learners are motivated. So many times our classes are free or low cost, and our students are here because they want to be here because they're motivated to succeed. And does that mean that they're always going to complete their homework? No, but we'll get into a discussion of adult barriers in just a few minutes. Um, so I view, I view this as a challenge and a benefit, right? The, the diversity of our learners. So they might vary in what their first languages are, in their educational backgrounds. Um, I've had classes where there are over 12 different languages spoken. Um, some of those students contributing seven languages on their own. I've had classrooms where people have advanced degrees, people who maybe stopped going to formal education in third grade. And so uh, this diversity of experience really enhances our classroom, but it also poses an instructional challenge. Um, and that's that is something that universal design does very well is reaching our diverse audience. And I'll talk about that. Um, we also know that our students are goal motivated. And so sometimes I turn purple, I'm not quite sure why it's a thing with Dell's <laughs> just a warning. Um, and they want to see things that are applicable to their lives. And we might think, well, of course, everything we're teaching them is important to their lives, but we forget sometimes to make those connections. And as we explore UDL, we do so knowing that our students need contextualized learning. And lastly, for our purposes today, our learners are, of course, skilled. Right? They come with knowledge and skills that can enhance our classrooms. I have yet to meet a learner in my class who doesn't have something that they are really good at. So cooking, fabrication, fixing machines, providing health services, whatever it might be, we're not working with blank slates, right? We are working with knowledgeable, experienced people. So what is the goal of UDL? What, what is universal design for learning? And the goal is to provide people with the skills and knowledge to become expert learners, right? Who doesn't want to be an expert learner? And part of what I like about UDL is that it transcends the classroom. These are skills that will help them when they get on the job training. It helps them when they work with their children. It helps when they tackle learning something new, whether it's physics, baking, or pickleball. I don't know if we have any pickleballers out there. That seems to be a thing. The UDL framework, which I shared in the link in the chat, shows what an expert learner looks like. And I've put it up here as well. So for those who don't want to toggle, here it is. An expert learner is purposeful and motivated. They are resourceful and knowledgeable. They are strategic and goal-directed. Sounds nice, right? Not only do I want that for my students in class, but I want those skills in myself. Before we dive into those principles, though, I want to give a little bit of background as to where UDL came from, because at least from my perspective, it really helped me to visualize it better. So universal design for learning came from universal design, which is an architectural concept. And I'm going to use my house as an example. I live um, in a house that's 119 years old built in 1905 before the Titanic um, just and to enter my house you have to walk up stairs to get into the house every entrance there are some stairs every room is separated by fairly narrow corridors and door frames um, I have probably the world's smallest tightest bathroom in the entire world my house was not built for somebody who needs to use a mobility device. It was not built for someone who um, needs knee replacements like my dad. Only the first floor of my house is available to him at this point. Someone in a wheelchair couldn't get into my house, let alone through the door frames. They couldn't take a shower, do laundry, go to any bedroom in my house. Universal design 
came about in architecture to say, well, as we build public spaces, we need to build them so that they are accessible to all. Again, the goal was not to add on ADA compliant features after the building was built, but to build that structure from the bottom up with everybody in mind. And this, of course, can be taken into learning, right? So just like those automatic doors at the grocery store that are helpful for someone in a wheelchair, it's helpful for someone pushing a cart. It's helpful when I have a kid who's tantruming and I have to push them in the stroller. Um, it's helpful when I'm stubborn and I'm trying to carry all my groceries and just my two arms and I don't even have a finger free at that point, right? So it helps somebody who forgets their contacts. So those small changes are beneficial for those who absolutely need them, but they also benefit everybody. So taking that idea into our classrooms, like if we design our classrooms for all learners, then everybody will be able to thrive. And we can look at the UDL chart um, in two different ways. The ways it's laid out is there are verticals and horizontal rows. And so I'm gonna start with kind of the vertical categories which each are color coded um, because this, these are categorized based on our neural networks because UDL is based on brain science. Um, and the engagement section focuses on the why of learning. That's our affective networks. How do we get people engaged and interested in what we're doing in classes so that they can focus and learn? It also means minimizing threats and distractions, providing mastery-oriented feedback and developing self-assessment and reflection. And ultimately, this creates that learner who's purposeful and motivated. The representation category focuses on the recognition networks. That is the what of learning. What are they doing? So how are we as educators diversifying our instruction and resources to reach all students? And this is, I think, really where a lot of our technology shines, right? So um, this column includes things like offering alternatives to auditory and visual information, um, activating and supplying background knowledge, and ultimately it creates that resourceful and knowledgeable expert learner. So when you show somebody how to use the YouTube controls to slow down the rate of speech, how to add on those closed captionings, this is that, that section that it's falling into. And then lastly, action and expression focuses on the strategic networks, the how. So what are we asking our students to do in the classroom? How are we trying to vary the methods for response and navigation? Like it's going to get really boring if I'm standing there and I'm just trying to do a call and response for the full three hours of my classroom. But it also is only allowing one type of individual to thrive. Um, and this also includes those building fluencies, having those graduated levels of support and guiding appropriate goal setting. And ultimately we get our strategic and goal-directed learner from this. And I do wanna highlight that the effective UDL in the classroom means including things from all of those columns. So as educators, we may want to focus only on representation because we feel like that's something we can control, right? We can provide things in the visual and the auditory. Right. Um, however, by doing so, we might also be neglecting those other components, limiting ourselves and limiting the opportunity for learning in our classes. Um, so I'll provide you an example because you might be thinking, I, do I have to completely redo my classroom? No, no, not at all. There are things that you are doing every day that align with UDL. So for example, even for this lightning talk, I, uh, for, for under the engagement category, I told you what our goals were today. That's one of the checkpoints. Um, and Rachel will be providing the, the video on YouTube. She will be providing the slides. That's representation. You have different ways of accessing it later. 
And then for action and expression, you have the opportunity to ask questions in the chat or to wait for breakout rooms and be able to ask questions orally. So UDL doesn't mean in reinventing the wheel. It just means there's a strategy. It means that as an educator, all of those things I'm doing in a class, after I have a successful class and I step back and think, what part of that made it a successful class? Um, at least I know these are the things that neuroscience, that learning science has said are effective. So we looked at those vertical categories, but as an educator, I love looking at them horizontally because this makes more sense to me than saying, okay, this is how we engage. This is how we access different information. Um, and then this is how we you know, participate differently. So the principles are in three rows across all those area, areas. And so first, at kind of that foundational row is that they need to access it. So at the bottom here, they need to be able to first access the information. If they can't, nothing else <laughs> matters, right? When we're talking about digital literacy and digital equity, if they don't have access to that learning, they can't do anything further. So again, this is where we provide them different ways of accessing content. Then secondly, they need to be able to build understanding. This happens through collaboration, through community, through um, being able to get uh, feedback from an instructor. And then lastly, our learners need to internalize the learning. And I'm not gonna lie, this is my favorite part because it's the part I would skip over when I was short on time before really diving into UDL um, because I thought, all right, they can access the content. We've gotten into the content. We need to keep going because I have 85 content standards and outcomes that I need to reach in my classroom. Um, but this is where you see how learning doesn't just change what we know, but also how we approach learning our, itself. So internalized learning happens through self-assessment and reflection, through activation of background knowledge, and through monitoring one's own progress. And again, this is through the our students' perspective, right? their self-assessment, their monitoring of progress, their reflection, not only on what they're learning, but in how they are learning it. Now, this doesn't mean you should necessarily just start with the access row and plan to work your way through because learner variability is the norm. We are all different learners. There are quirky things about how I learn that are different from the quirky things um, about how somebody else learns. Um, but it does offer a different way to kind of approach that UDL application to think of it in terms of accessing, building, and internalizing. Um, so I hope you don't mind, but I packed everyone's backpack for our little UDL hike here, and I made sure to pack all the guidelines for access and build those horizontal rows, because those are the ones I want to dig into a little bit more. And we're just going to run through. We're going to double check that we have everything because we don't want to like go out there and get eaten by a bear or something. So first, we packed interest. So you can see within this guideline, there are certain checkpoints. And I've pulled, just for ease of this presentation, some important words from those checkpoints because, honestly, I don't have enough room to pack up the full sentences here. Um, so you can see things like choice, relevance, authenticity, and less distractions. I packed perception, customizing display and auditory and visual alternatives. Packed some action in there. It fell to the bottom of the pack with my keys and my chapstick, but we've got response, navigation, and assistive technologies. So those would be things like talk to text or... Um, technologies that allow you to alter perhaps the font or the contrast. We also have persistence. Oof, like this is a big one. <laughs> we talk about barriers and obstacles that our students face. 
Um, and we want to give them tools to to get through those barrier barriers. So right, having our goals and our objectives, having varied demands, collaboration and feedback are what keep our learners coming back. And in the side pocket here, we have language. And this feels like an obvious one, especially if you teach English language learners, but it's also essential when you teach any subject like math, like marketing, right? You need to define what that vocabulary is, what the symbols are. And lastly, we have communication, whether it's construction, composition, or graduated levels of support. And so it's not just enough to put these things in our backpack, but we need to know how to use them. And so I wanna give some examples of how we can use them. So if we take a closer look at interest, I'm going to provide the topic of a job interview. It's a broad topic um, and we can teach it likely at very different levels. And so I've given the three, I've given three questions based on the checkpoints from the interest guideline. So relevance, how can we make this topic relevant? How can we make it authentic? And how can we provide um, either English language learners or adult education students with choices. So for the first one, we don't want to assume that job interviews are automatically relevant. Some students don't work. They don't have a plan to work in the next decade. Um, some already have jobs that they don't plan to leave. Some are small business owners. Um, and so I'd love to see in the chat if you have ideas as we go through, how can you make it relevant? For authenticity, I'll give an example for my class, but I invite you to, again, share your ideas in the chat. So in my class, I've asked an outside person, usually program staff or another teacher, to come in and act as an interviewer, and they interview the students. Why is that more authentic than me interviewing the students? Because they know me. They're not nervous <laughs> answering my questions because I ask them questions every class. But having an outside person that they don't know as well provides that um, kind of authentic nervousness that we get in a job interview. And then how can I provide my learners with choice? Well, if my outcomes say students will answer interview questions orally, I can't give them the choice to write <laughs> the, their interview answers down. What I can do, however, is offer them options, perhaps on the job they're interviewing for, I can give them options on how they want to prepare for the interview. I've had some students who want to prepare orally with somebody else in class. Somebody else wanted to write all their answers down word for word because that made them feel more confident and comfortable. And then they could kind of go off the cuff and answer them orally. So the choices stay within our outcomes, within our objectives. It's not the Wild West, but we are able to make sure that we're reaching each of those. And that was our access and our build levels. And now we're at the, we're finally at the internalizing. And these tools help with self-regulation, comprehension, and executive functions. And so you can see here um, things like expectations, motivation, self-assessment, reflection, background knowledge, visualization, goal setting, strategy. So let's let's dig a little deeper here because there are too many principles to cover in the remaining amount of time. So I'm going to select the ones that I love the most and that I have some examples that I can share with you. And um, so here I'm going to take a closer look at reflection. So content reflection is something that we're probably familiar with. Right, so how will you use this in your life? You ask students about what they learned, how they might apply it, and it serves as like a formative assessment or an exit ticket. But under UDL, we look at reflection on learning. And oh, this is, this is like my favorite one to do in class because it's just incredible to have these discussions with students. But how did you approach the task? So you ask students about how they approached the task, what choices they made, 
why they made the, that choice that they did and if they would do it the same again. I've had students say, well, I did it this way because I saw everybody else doing it that way, but I, it didn't work for me. Or, well, I tried doing it this way and then I decided to slightly change it and this works really well for me. And what happens after you start getting them into this practice is that they start advocating for themselves in terms of what they need within the classroom. I had a student say, teacher, I need to do my reading orally. Like I need to read it out loud during silent reading time. So can I have a space away from everybody else so I don't disturb them where I can do that reading out loud? So I warn you, students might start asking you why you are choosing to do things the way that you are, um, which is always a wonderful feeling when you have students say, well, okay, well, why did you make this choice? Why are we doing this activity this way? Um, because empowering students will ultimately make us all better. A quick note, I'm not going to dig into this, but in terms of applying UDL, it really works with backward design, where you start with your outcomes, you have your assessments, and then you think about what your objectives are, and you make those choices in terms of how you're going to approach your class work. Some common questions. Well, if I'm giving, if I'm, you know, does this make it easier? Does it undermine the rigor? Absolutely not putting up extra barriers just to try to make something more complicated, saying, well, I'm only going to give five minutes for people to read it. That doesn't make something more rigorous. It just enacts an unnecessary barrier. So we can make things cognitively complex, but also make them accessible and equitable. Sounds like a lot of work, Erin. How much time does this add to lesson planning? It does add some time, but there is a fun thing called the plus one principle, which means every time you teach a lesson, you just add one UDL spark to it. And then each time you come back to that lesson, you're adding one more thing. And by the time you've taught that lesson four or five times, it is, you know, it, it's all worked up and you don't need to add those additional pieces. Somebody says, I need to assess certain skill areas. How can I still give choices? The choices are all in like how you allow them to practice and prepare leading up to that assessment. And then, well, I don't know how to implement some of these principles. How do I find tools? How do I find mentorship? Well, we have a lot of different options for you. And I'll make sure that these are all... Um, queued up on the slides that are shared so that you can see. So CAST, uh, they are the experts of UDL. Um, they have a lot of information. My, my note here would be a lot of it is focused on K-12 and higher education, which is why we created the CTAE SIG. It's a free ju uh, group that you can join. We have three meetings a year you can engage in. There are recordings on the website that's linked. Um, and we really focus on how to bring it into the realm of, of adult education. Um, Lynx also has UD, a free UDL asynchronous course that you can work your way through. Um, we have some general resources on the Illinois PDN website. Um, and then this last one, Novak Education. So caveat, the website does have paid courses, but what I really like is that Dr. Katie Novak, who's a big name in UDL, does provide some free resources for planning lessons that are really good. And so that is also a wonderful place to start if you want to start kind of poking around a bit. Thank you so much, Erin. That was so great. Such a nice little intro. I know UDL is, is big and deep, and so there's a lot to cover in um, just a short time there, but I really appreciate you giving us that overview. Um, we, oh, I sound like a robot. Do I have a? It's kind of quiet and robotic. Okay, well, cool. I like it. Um, <laughs> 
So we are now going to, we're, we're going to go through questions. Uh, we're, I mean, we're going to pass over questions, but um, you can, Aaron's going to be in a breakout room at two o'clock. So if you would like to ask Aaron questions, join her in the breakout room or put your questions in the chat and we can have her um, try to put some answers in the chat and do an email Q&A um, and cover those in an email, okay? So I don't know why I'm going to grow up.